Hi everybody, uh, welcome to our Monday night Zoom on uh, Monday the 13th of June and we are so lucky to have Danny Wells, our own RVP, joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce her and tell, a little bit, tell you a little bit first of all about how we met because I know some of you know you were there at the time, well not when we met online but when I was uh, joining Arvon. Um, but some of you um, have more recently know our story, our background. So basically, when I had Hazel back in October 2014, I didn't know Danny at all, did not heard of Arbon, nothing at all. And then at five weeks, when Hazel got really poorly and we ended up in hospital, I was struggling to um, express milk and I wanted to feed her. She was being fed by a nasal tube. Um, and I had this one frantic call to my auntie saying, oh, I don't know what to do. My milk's drying up. I don't know how to express. And she just said, well, I know this girl who's been through a really similar situation. Um, I'll, I'll put you in contact through Facebook. So I started talking to Danny, who I'm sure she'll tell you in a minute, had similar issues with her little, daughter, uh, little girl when she was born. But she also was a, a, peer, a breastfeeding peer supporter as well. So again, we just talked online and she was really great support while I was in hospital and then didn't think anything of it, like when we came out of hospital. But I just kept seeing on Facebook these um, photographs keep coming up and these posts from Danny about how she was having an amazing time. And I think at that point, would you have been about around district um, area manager around now, I think? Yeah, either district or a new area. Yeah, so I think it was when I saw you go to Arizona, so that would have been area. Yeah, I, started to kind of, I started to prick my ears up and think, what is she doing? Because at the time, I'd made it my mission that when I went on maternity leave, that I was not going back to teaching. I was going to look for something else. There was something else to life. I wasn't going to sit there and mark for the rest of my life. Um, so I asked her, I just sent her a message one day and I was like, oh, you know, we're out of hospital now. Things are really good. What is it that you do? Because I really like the look of your job. So she told me I did network marketing, which I had not got a clue, never heard of it, didn't know anything about it. I'd heard of Forever Living, but I didn't realise that was network marketing. Um, so I just kept asking her, I was probably like the worst person ever. I asked like a million questions um constantly over months just kept quizzing a quizzing her and i went away with phil and researched everything until i think i said to you probably in about february march time i'm in you know end of the questions i'm in but i'm going to wait until i go back to work in august which i don't know if that was me now i'd probably think oh no they're just fobbing me off but i actually that was what i decided i was going to do it but i was going to wait until i'd got some money when i was back at work and I don't like having regrets or looking back on anything, but that's probably one thing I think, oh, if I'd have just jumped in right then when I'd made my mind up, just made it work, I'd be that much further ahead and I've had that much more time, which is why when I speak to other people, it's a bit like saying, there's nothing to wait for, just go. You know, there's never like that perfect time. Just go for it, just jump in and do it. Um, best decision I made. So in August, that was the first time I actually met Danny, or was it just before August? I met Danny in real life, never met her, only virtually, only spoke to her online. And we met in a soft play. Um, and I don't actually remember you doing the DA or anything, because I think I just... I don't think I did. I think I just talked to you about our one. Yeah, I pretty much just made my mind up anyway. It wasn't, you know, you didn't need to convince me. My mind was made up. I was going to sign. And it was more about... I wanted everything. How was I going to get it all in <laughs> straight away? I just wanted all the products. Oh, because I went to I went to a DA when Danny was on holiday because so I'd made my mind up. I wanted to do it, but I just wanted to check the products out. So I went to a DA and I met Jane Brown. Um, it was really interesting one. They'd had a venue um, double booking, so they had we had to do it in like the car park on a bench. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's um, my little story about how I met Danny. Um, tonight, Danny's going to talk to you about um, her journey through Arbon, how she's built her business, and she's also got a few top tips um, that I wanted her to share with us. So I'll pass you to Danny. Yes, first of all, I just want to say thank you for you guys for all saying yes to starting your own business. You obviously all own your own shop. You all own your own on online Arbon shop and you all are incredible business owners. And first of all, like I just said, I just want to say thank you because 
you guys have said yes, you've paved the way for such a massive difference in my business and in our entire team. You guys are the ones that people look at as, as the ones that make it real. You're like, well, if their team are doing it, there's nothing stopping us. And I'm like, exactly. So I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. You are absolute trailblazers, in my opinion. Vic was the first person that I sponsored that I actually sponsored correctly. The first people that I sponsored before Vic, I did not have a clue what I was doing. And I don't think I was actually doing things the right way. So when I sponsored Vic, she was so amazing. And we just, we did this together. And even though I had my album business before Vic, we kind of did almost start at the same time because I did not have a clue what I was doing. So she will always, always have a special place in my heart. And so will this entire team. And if there's anything that I can ever do to help any of you guys, whether that's doing a one-to-one -one for you or with you or workshop or online call, anything, you just have to drop me a message and I will do that and be there for you because I just think you're all just absolutely fantastic, individual, fantastic people and then an amazing team. The love and the spirit and the community that Vic and you guys have all built is incredible. I get asked about it all the time. I'm like, what's Vic McHale doing? What are her team doing? And I'm like, do you know what? They're not doing anything different to what anybody can do. They're just linking arms together. They just all literally are good friends. They all want to help each other. They all have different strengths and weaknesses and they share their strengths with other people's weaknesses and they literally want to help each other. There's no dog eat dogs. There's no trampling over everybody. Everybody's just one big team. And that's the culture and the community that Vic has started and everybody in this team is continuing to grow. And it's amazing to see. It really is. I've never ever seen anything like it in my life and it's just wonderful. So I'm very grateful. So I'm going to share with you my story. I know some of you already know it. So um, I'm going to add in a few of my tips along the way as well. So I actually built my career up um, in an optician, which was Specsavers Opticians. I had a seven-year career. I started there when I was 19, and I worked my way up to the top. I did all different training courses. I went on different events, and I, and I worked my way quite high up at the opticians, and I loved it. I really did love working at Specsavers. So seven years I was there for. And while I was there, I had my first daughter, Farah, who's five. And I decided when I had Farah that I was going to go back to work part time. So to be honest, I had what I would call quite a perfect life. I was working part time, had a fabulous income and part time. I was with my daughter, quite present in her life. I had um, my, my now husband, who was then my partner, we had a good car. We lived in a lovely house, even though it was only rented. We loved it and we had nice holidays and everything was great. And what we didn't have was a plan B. And this is what I'm hugely passionate about now because people think that they don't need a plan B because they never feel like anything's going to happen to their spouse, to them, to their parents, to their children. You know, they never think that anything's going to go wrong. Life is just life. They never think that tomorrow it all might just crumble and there's no plan B to fall back on. And I didn't. I was exactly like that. And I really did need a plan B when my second daughter was born. So my second daughter, Ivana, came along after a very healthy pregnancy. And I managed to have a really great birth with her. My first was a C-section. So I was delighted that my second one was a natural birth. I had everything that I wanted. I had the water. I breastfed her. Everything that I could possibly want on my birth plan was ticked off. And then we went home with our new baby girl. And we went home with her. And my husband said, something's not right. And I was a new mom. And anyone that's obviously got children will know that when you've just had a baby, you're not quite with it. You're a bit like spaced out, a bit out of it. And Ian was like, something's not right with the baby. And I was like, oh, Ian, you, you, you're worrying. She's fine. She's a new baby. And Ian was so, so like, no, Danny, listen, something's not right. I was like, all right, fine. So the midwife came over to our house because we were at home and she agreed. She said, something's not right with this baby. And she rushed us straight back into Leicester. I think Ivana was only about 24 hours old. So we'd got home and then we were back in Leicester, a different hospital this time at the Royal. And at first they thought she had a bit of a viral infection. And to be honest, I was still a bit dazed out by the whole birth and everything. I wasn't quite actually with it. I didn't even take an overnight bag because I expected we'd be straight back home. I didn't expect to be living in the hospital from then onwards. So um, they thought she had a viral infection and they gave her antibiotics. And while she was on these antibiotics, a couple of hours into the night, she stopped breathing. And all of a sudden, all these people came rushing in. And it's a bit of a blur for me. But they started um, doing like the, the support on the or whatever it's called, like the first aid thing, where they bring you back if, if you're starting to go, that that thing. And um, me and Ian were a bit, were you going to say the word of it, Vic? 
CPR. Yeah, that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so me and Ian were a bit like, oh my God, what's going on? And that's when they said, like, okay, we've brought her back, but she's having seizures. And I was like, why? What's wrong with her? And they were like, we're not sure, but it, this is serious. And at this point, I was like, oh my God, like, this is serious. And they whisked her off for a CT scan. And they said, it's not good news. She's got a massive bleed on her brain and she's going to have to go for an MRI scan to, to see the severity of it. So I was like, oh my God. So at this point, it was probably like two o'clock in the morning. I was completely like sleep deprived. I did not know what was going on. And then the MRI scan said she was actually having a severe brain hemorrhage that an adult wouldn't even be able to survive from and a stroke. And they said, you know, it's gonna, she's not going to make it through the night. And she was put on life support machine. And me and Ian were just like, what the heck do you do when you're told that? We just did not know what to do. So we were obviously were just in floods of tears. I sat beside her. And like, luckily, and thankfully, and I'm just so grateful, she did start to, to make herself better again. And she's four now. And many of you guys have met her anyway. She's a little miracle. But back then... We were told that after being on life support, she was on intensive care, and then she moved to a high dependency ward, that the damage to her brain was so severe, it had damaged so much of her brain, that she would never be able to walk, she wouldn't be able to talk, she just would, she'd be an adult that needed like hygiene and care and everything. So when this was all happening, one thing that makes me very, very angry with myself is that Ian had to go back to work because his job was one of the types of jobs that if he doesn't go into work, he doesn't get paid. So he's a tiler. And if he doesn't stick tiles on a floor or a wall, he does not get paid. And 99% of people have jobs like that where they don't, they don't earn money like we do in Arbonne. We earn residual income. But most people's jobs, they physically have to exchange their time to earn that income. And that was Ian's job. And it makes me so cross that we didn't have any other source of income at that time. So Ian actually had to leave his child in hospital and go back to work because if he didn't, our house would be gone, our bills would be paid. We had another little girl at home that you know she needed financially looking after. And it makes me really cross that I didn't do Arbonne before I found out about Arbonne. And that is one thing I'm massively passionate about now. And I say to people, even if when you start your own shop online with Arbonne, you don't become a national vice president and earn £50,000 a month, still build this business now because you just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow you just don't know if you're going to fall down the stairs and break your back if your husband or wife is if your parents are going to get ill if somebody needs you to not be working to look after them where is your income going to come from you need to think about this and this is what i say to people i say if our one isn't a fit for you that's absolutely fine but please make sure you've got some sort of plan b where you know if your main source of income isn't coming in where are you going to generate two thousand pounds a month from to actually survive and live so you need to make sure you have a plan b i'm so passionate about that now because of how much i wish i'd had it then so anyway going back then we were told that when ivana left hospital like a few months later that she would be around care she was completely brain damaged and she would just need all of these hospital appointments so i said to ian one of us is going to have to give up our careers because who else is going to look after her? You know, she's our child. One of us needs to do this. So I decided to give up my career at the opticians. And um, I rang my boss up and I said, look, you know, I've been working there seven years, but this has happened to Ivana. I I'm just not able to come back. And he was really understanding. But when I left, I obviously left, I left my income behind as well. So rather than earning like one and a half thousand pounds a month, that was gone. And what I received was 60 pounds a week carer's allowance. Now, don't get me wrong. Because we live in the United Kingdom, we are looked after by our government when we need to be looked after. And I am so grateful for that. Like, I don't know many other countries that would do that. And I'm very, very grateful for that £60 a week. However, it didn't, it didn't cover anything. Not really. Like, absolutely. It didn't even cover the petrol to keep taking her back and forth to the hospital. So we ended up getting into severe debt. Ian was working seven days a week just to pay our bills. Our outgoings were like £2,000 a month and we only had coming in like £1,000. So we were constantly getting more and more into debt every single month. Ian would get paid. He'd pay what we needed to pay for the first two weeks. And then there'd be two weeks left at the end of the month where we had nothing, like absolutely zero. And it was embarrassing. And I remember sharing a video once where Farah, my older daughter, went to preschool 
And one day they asked me for a pound towards the snack because every now and again we take it in turns as parents to put money in towards the snack. I didn't even have one pound. Like that is how humiliating it was. And I think now who doesn't have like one pound lying around? But I, we literally did not even have like, if we saw a penny, we would have it because we were that desperate for money. We just had nothing. And at that time of my life, I was like, I'm sick of my life. I'm sick of living this way. Like when I grew up, I did not expect to have children and have to be scraping around for pennies and can't even give my child's daughter, my daughter's preschool a pound for snack. Like this is not a lie. This is not what I want to inspire my children to be like. Like I had no friends because all I did was moan about woe is me. And I was the victim to all of this bad stuff that happened in my life. And it wasn't fair. So nobody really wanted to be around me that much. And um, we got, we were about £40,000 in debt by this point now. Just, we didn't buy anything that was a luxury. It was just trying to pay our bills. The car was an absolute bag of like rust. It was just horrible. And on top of all of that, I'd lost my identity. So I wasn't me anymore. I was just a shell that was like a robotic version of me, just taking Farrah and Ivana to their hospital appointments and to preschool. And there was nothing about me. I was like an empty vessel. And um, I was depressed. I had severe anxiety. And I was just like, this is this life is just awful. So one day I was on Facebook and Emma Dickinson, who was one of my friends from Playgroup, had put something on Facebook about working from home with their children. Now, I knew Emma was not the type of person to write a book or make a CD or she wasn't crafty. So if she was doing something from home, it 100% wasn't skill-based because I knew that she didn't have any skills. You know, there are some people that we probably all know that could, they're quite crafty and they can make like sock monkeys and sell them or they can write a book and sell it or a CD. But I knew that she wasn't like that. So I was really intrigued. So I would message her and I was like, Emma, what's your business that you're doing around the kids from home? And she said, oh, Danny, I've just started. It's absolutely amazing. And actually, I think you would really love to hear more about it. Come over for a coffee. So I was like, okay. So Ivana was two at this point and Farrah was three. So I went over to Grantham, which is about half an hour away from me, to listen to Emma's business. And she said she'd only just started, so she didn't have a clue what she was talking about. And she didn't have a sponsor there. So it was just me and Emma. I think she started like two days before. And she was like, Danny, have you heard of Arbonne? And I was like, no she was like oh, okay have you heard of network marketing and I was like no she said all oh, right okay okay well have you heard about products that are bought in shops that have all the toxins and the chemicals in and I was like no like honestly I didn't have a clue back then what I know now and she was like all oh, right okay well basically in shops they sell products like we all buy I was like yeah get that she said but for them to have like a 99p price tag there's a reason why they're that cheap and the reason why they're that cheap in shops like Poundland and stuff is because they have all this crap in it like literally all the waste and the byproducts that nobody else would want is like shipped up into these products to like water them down I was like really she was like yep she was and they have to have a shelf life of up to seven years so they add in all these chemical like parabens I didn't know what that meant then but she was like to give them a shelf life she was like imagine buying like an apple and knowing that apple's been around for seven years it must have had something chemical in it to enable it to last seven years I was like oh my god it's disgusting and she was like yeah so all the products that you buy from shops you just don't want to use I was like okay she goes so basically there's other companies like Arbon, but there are other companies that just believe that this is wrong. I was like, that is wrong. He said, yeah, I know. She goes, and they want to make products that are really good and don't have all the waste and, the, and all the rubbish in it. But if they were to be sold in a shop, they wouldn't be able to be affordable because they're going to have to pay for the advertising, the shop overheads. I was like, okay, okay. And I kind of was like, okay, I get this, I get this. And she said, so what they do is they pay people to own their own shop online and then we advertise it however we want to. A bit like if you've got your car and a company wants to put sign writing on your car to advertise their company and you're just driving it around like you are anyway, you're advertising a company while you're being paid just to drive that car around. I was like, what? So basically, if I start work with this company, I just walk around and advertise their products. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, well, am I like tied into anything? And she was like, nope. She goes, it's your shop. You can talk about it as much or as little as you want. And it's your business. You do what you want. And I was like, Emma, I'm in. Because the reason why I said I'm in is she hadn't even told me any of the prices at this point. I hadn't tried any of the products. I didn't even know you had to pay to start. I was like, I'm in. And the reason why I said I'm in was because I did not 
see any other way of getting out of the situation that we were in. The situation we were in was being sick of being in debt. I was sick of being miserable. I was sick of showing my children that that was our life. I was sick of like not being able to go on holiday. I was sick of my car breaking down. I just had enough. And she was the first person in two years to propose something to me that I could learn to do. You know, she'd sat there and said, you need to be a dancer or a singer. There's no way I'd be able to do that. But if she sat there and said, all you need to do is use these products and walk around and talk about what you think. I was like, well, I can do that. Like anybody can do that. So she was the first person in those two years that brought an idea to the table that I had a chance of being able to do. And even though I knew nothing about health, wellness and beauty, I knew nothing about skincare, knew nothing about business. And I knew from that day that nobody I knew was going to buy these products from me because like me, everybody I knew was a bit of a cheapskate and wouldn't in a million years buy good products. Nobody I knew knew you'd use good skincare or good nutrition and actually really cared. So I knew that everybody I knew was not going to support me in my business, in my shop. But I was like, do you know what? It doesn't matter because there are 95% of the population out there that I don't know that are looking for what I can talk about. So I knew that. I knew that I absolutely could make this a success, regardless to the fact that I didn't know anybody. So I was like, I'm in. And then she was like, right, it's 50 quid. And I was like, oh my God, you didn't say that. But I was like, I'm in anyway, I'm in anyway. So um, I put the money on the credit card and I started my business for 50 pounds. And even though 50 pounds was a massive amount of money for me back then, when I thought about it, I thought this 50 pounds is buying me a shop and a website, like I already knew that having a website costs more like 200 pounds a month, let alone 50 pounds of one-off payment. So I was already really impressed by that. And what I wanted to do was buy all of the products because I knew if I bought all of the products, I could talk about more of them and I could build my business faster, but I didn't have the money to, unfortunately. If I had have done, I would have bought all of the products, but I was restricted. So I just bought some of the products and I thought to myself, if I buy some of the products now, each month I can invest my money back into my business and buy more of the products. And what I'll do is I'll sell things around the house to invest that money into my business so that eventually I do have all of the products because I knew that I wanted to be able to use all of the products to talk about them, but I wasn't able to do it straight away. So that was fine. I just did it gradually over a couple of months. And I think it was about two or three months in that I finally had all of the products, which did make a big difference talking to people about them and being able to lend people the products for at-home trials as well. But anyway, I, I dove straight in. And as I, said, as I said to you all a minute ago, I knew that everybody I knew did not care about their health and did not care about their skincare and just were not bothered. So I already knew they were not going to buy the products from my shop. So I had to think to myself, who or how can I network with people that do care about their health, that do care about their skincare, and that do care about possibly owning their own shop so that they can build an extra, I don't know, £500 a month or £2,000 a month or whatever, whatever income they wanted to do. Obviously, the choice is ours. So what I decided to do was network with people and meet people and make friends. Now, if I didn't have children, what I would have done was I would have gone to the gym, I would have gone to yoga classes, I would have gone to business networking events, I would have networked at all these places in person, but I was more restricted because I didn't, I did have the children and because I was in hospital so much with Ivana, I was restricted to where I could make friends and network. So what I decided to do, Ian, just shut that down a minute, please. Yeah. So what I decided to do was make friends online. So for me, I was thinking outside the box. I could have sat there and written a list of all the reasons why Arbonne was difficult for me. Like I've got children. Uh, my husband's always at work. I don't have childcare. I don't have any money. I don't have any confidence. I could have wrote a massive list about all of the reasons why Arbonne wouldn't work for me. But I was like, where's that going to get me? So instead... I looked at the list of reasons of, how, of why I wanted to do Arbon and how can I make Arbon work. And it came clear to me that I needed to make connections with people. I needed to make friends with people. So I went online and I went onto Facebook groups, any Facebook groups that I had a connection with. So for me personally, I had connections with uh, being married in Cyprus. I'm on Cyprus brides groups, uh, breastfeeding groups, um, co-sleeping groups, gentle parenting groups. Uh, pole fitness groups, any any kind of connection I had. I definitely didn't go into groups with um, with the intention of lying. So for me, I wouldn't go into a group like um, 
uh, Peugeot drivers because I don't drive a Peugeot. So I only went into groups that I actually had a connection with. So it was honest and real. And I didn't go on as an Arbon consultant, you know, waving my shop around. I thought about Facebook groups the same as if I did go to the gym. And if you if I went to the gym and was like on the running machine next to somebody else on the running machine, the last thing I'd do is go, I own my own Arbon business. Are you looking for an opportunity of earning 500, 500 pounds a month? And you know, blah, 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 blah. Like you just wouldn't do that at the gym. You'd, you'd gradually go, oh, hi. Oh, I like your water bottle. Oh, where's that from? And I'd gradually build up some sort of chit chat. And that's what I did online. So if somebody would comment online, so let's say Mina wrote something online um, that I could add a comment to, I would add to that. So she might say something like, oh, has anybody been to France? I don't know. I would then comment on it. I've never actually been to France, but if I had, I'd be like, oh yeah, I've been to France. Where are you going? And she might be like, oh, I'm going blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, oh, it's lovely there. Like, you know what I mean? Just getting a conversation going. And then because we've had a bit of a conversation on a thread, on a group, I would then send Mina a friend request and a private message to say, oh, I've just added you as a friend. You seem like a really lovely person. Is that okay? Everybody, everybody says yes. If they know where you've come from, they say yes. If, if you send a random friend request, they're a bit like, oh, I don't know where you've come from. But when they've seen that you've had a bit of a chat, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And then I would then follow Mina on Facebook and some people you just be like, you don't want to be friends with because they're just really weird. So then just delete them. But if they seem really nice and really genuine, really compassionate, comment on their statuses, like their things, ask them if they've got children. Well, what do you do for a job? Just in like conversation. i be like, oh, have you got any pets? Oh, I've got two cats. And conversation will flow. And then eventually they will say to you, what do you do for a job? Because I keep seeing on your Facebook wall, like all of this fun that you're having and team meetings and online calls and business from home, like what is it? And then you just tell them, um, you can either book a one-to-one -one to tell them or you can tell them online, like whatever your preference is. But it's as simple as that. And I think the biggest thing that people get hung up on and what I've seen uh, from my network of people that own their own shops is people get hung up on thinking that, the way they're going to have a successful business is just relying on their friends and family. And you can't rely on your friends and family. You can't rely on people that you know, because most of the time people that you know don't really care about your financial situation. They don't really care that you don't have time together as a family. They don't really care about a lot of things. So you're best off just accepting that your friends and family are probably never going to enable you to be a district manager and beyond. So you have to accept that you're going to have to learn the skill about meeting new people. The same as if, I'll give you an example. My husband has just um, decided to hand his notice in at work, which is amazing. That was a big goal of ours, and start his own business. And he's a tiler, like I was saying, and he's going to start his own business up. And um, what, uh, imagine if he then said to me, Danny, my dream is to be a tiler. That's what I want to do. But everybody I know has already had their kitchen and the bathroom tiled. So nobody I know wants what I have to offer. So I might just give up on my dream. I'm like, don't give up on your dream. Don't be so silly. Your dream is to be a tiler. Don't, don't worry about who you know that um, already has a kitchen and bathroom tiled. It doesn't matter about that. What matters is you go out there and you meet other people because I tell you now, Ian, there are lots of other houses that want their kitchen and their bathroom tiling. You just don't know them yet. You need to get out there and meet them. And what you need to do is you need to tell all of your friends and family that you started your own tiling business and could they refer people to you that they know, that you don't know, in their network and then send them your way. And that's exactly like our Arbon business. We can't start an Arbon business and have our own shop and say, nobody I know is interested in my shop. Nobody I know wants my products. Nobody I know wants to join my business because it doesn't matter about who you know because there are people out there that do want what you have. You just need to find them. And however you find them is your choice, whether that's Facebook networking, whether that's business networking events, whether that's networking um, at the gym or at classes, like, it doesn't matter. You can network anyway. You can even network with customer service people, people that give you good customer service, whether you're booking a holiday or having a, a dinner or in a shop. All you have to say is, oh my gosh, your customer service has been absolutely amazing. I'm like seriously impressed. Do you happen to keep your career options open? And most people go, oh, yeah, I suppose. Like they're a bit like, oh, you go, the thing is, I run my own business and um, what I do is I help other people to work with me to um, recommend products and recommend things online in their spare time. The income is 
phenomenal. Um, I tell you what, let me take your details and I'll send you some information later. Something like that. To be honest, it usually comes off the cuff for me. So I could probably think about something better to say, but I can send it to you later. Something that comes to me that's better. If you haven't already tried that with people that you don't know, I would make a suggestion that you try it in an area that you don't live in with at least 10 people because the first 10 times you do it, you're going to be an absolute mess. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be sweating. You're not going to know what to say. You're just going to absolutely mess it up. So the first 10 times that you speak to somebody in your cold market that's giving you customer service, do it where you'll never ever see them again. And just accept the first 10 times are going to be rubbish. But after that, you'll get really good at it and you'll get in the flow and you'll be absolutely, every single time you go anywhere, you'll be getting people's contact details and sending them information about what you do. And you'll see your team absolutely start to flourish because there are people out there that are going to sleep every night stressed because of financial reasons. There are people out there that are going to sleep stressed about their health. There are people out there going to sleep stressed about their skin. They cannot even leave the house without a ton of makeup on because their skin is stressing them out that much. There are people out there stressed about going back to work and leaving their children. There are people out there stressed because their parents have got cancer and they want to be there to look after them and care for them, but they can't because they've got to go to work. So there are people out there. All you have to do as part of your business, as part of your shop, is to get your word out there, is to tell other people. And I massively, massively understood that when I owned my own shop, when I started my own business. I didn't get hung up on the fact that everybody I knew was not going to be interested in what I had to offer. However, interestingly enough, I was right in the beginning. They did not care about these products. But because of the difference they've seen in me in terms of my health, like they've seen my health massively, massively increase, like hugely, while there's decreases. And they've gone, oh my gosh, like it's worth every penny. Whatever you're doing is worth every penny. They've seen my skin improve. They've seen my hair care improve. They've seen my bank balance improve. You know, I went out for dinner on Saturday night with my friends that I've been friends with for years. And they were all like, God, you're like loaded now, aren't you? And I just laughed. I was like, I don't, I don't see it that way. But I work very hard with my business. And I absolutely love it. And they're all like, you've just done amazingly. And now they all do buy from my shop, even though two years ago, they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have cared less about 30 pound cleanser. But now they see it as worthwhile, because I think I must have planted that many seeds into them. Uh, it, yeah, it might have taken two years. But now they're like, yeah, yeah, we get it. We get it. So um, it's been amazing. And one other thing I really wanted to say is how worth it is. So for me, when I started my online shop, my online business, I decided that I wanted to be earning the type of income that the third level brings you. So regional vice president, so the third of four levels. The regional vice president level, I knew was going to bring me like two, three, four thousand pounds a month, somewhere in that figure. And I knew that if I did that within one year, Ian wouldn't have to work as much. I knew we could clear our debt. I knew that we could save money every single month to buy a house outright, which, we, which we're on the way to doing, you know. We rent our house, and before we know it, we're gonna be able to buy a £200,000 house in cash. Like, where else can you do that unless you have an Arvon business? So back then, I knew that I was gonna be the third level within one year, but I was aware that because I came into this business without any skills, I had no people skills, I had no confidence skills, I had no health and beauty product skills, it was gonna take a lot of my energy and effort to learn everything that I didn't already come into the business with. And you'll see people come into this business and they already have people skills, they already have public speaking skills, they already have confidence skills, they already have knowledge of product skills, but I didn't have any of that. And that's okay because you can do it still, but you just have to accept that you're going to have to learn about it. So for the first year in this business, I put 110% of energy and effort into building this business. And there was times when I was exhausted. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, people are asking me all these questions about pure vibrance and ABC and I just don't know the answer and every time someone asked me a question I had to go and find the answer out on the source or on the whatsapp now I don't have to do that now I know the answers off by heart but back then it took a lot of my energy to be able to give people the answers and to build a team of people that were very different to me I'd never ever led people I'd never ever had to help you know, bring out the best in other people I'd never had any anything in my life where people were wor working with me that didn't believe in themselves and I had to instill that belief into them and all of that was exhausting because I wasn't used to it however one year in I did get to the level I wanted to get to and 
I've obviously been doing Arbonne for two years now. So for the past year, I am literally, in my opinion, living the dream lifestyle that I could never have just imagined would be possible for me. My income is like £7,000 a month, every single month. I work very part-time now. And what I do now is mostly giving my time to other people because I want to, not because financially I have to. I don't think, oh, I have to do some album because I need to get paid. I don't feel like that. I feel like I want to give my time up to help other people. We get to go on holidays whenever we want and we get to be able to just pay it like just like that it's like yeah, yeah, yeah I'll put the card details in when I pay for things on my chip and pin and put my card into the chip and pin machines at shops and things I never ever have that gut-wrenching feeling in my stomach of oh my god is it going to decline which I used to always have when I log on to my online banking I don't get that sick feeling of oh what minus is it going to say because I used to always get that and now I don't every week I volunteer at two different charities. On a Thursday morning, I take children with disabilities swimming every Thursday because I've got the time to be able to give and do that and I, I massively enjoy it. I love helping. I get to volunteer as a breastfeed and peer support worker and give up my time to do that. Because of Arbor, because I built my business within that first year, I'm able to do that volunteer work that I want to do. I'm able to give money to charities that are really important to me. I get to buy clothes that I would never ever have bought in, in my life before. I get to have my hair done. I get to have my nails done, which is just crackers. Like all these things are crackers. But it, I'm so grateful to myself that I did the work that I wanted to do in the first year. I did a lot of the work in the first year. Now for some people, they will build their business slowly and they might spend like the first 10 years building their business. But I crammed that into one year. And yes, there was highs. Yes, there was lows. Yes, I was exhausted sometimes, but it was worth it because I crammed it into one year. And now I literally do, like I said, in my opinion, have like a dream life. I absolutely love it. And I love it when people say to me, can you help me do what you did? And when they say to me, I want to do everything to do this within a year like you did, I say to them, it's not easy. You know, it's going to take effort but at least it's temporary effort now for a long-term gain. And what I've been able to do for my children is priceless. Like I've inspired them to be more confident. I've inspired them that when they're learning to ride a bike, which they don't know how to do, I say to them, just keep practicing, just keep practicing. I say, because that's what mummy did with Arbonne, remember? Mummy didn't know how to do Arbonne. Mummy didn't know how to have a shot on my phone. But mummy kept practicing and kept doing it and doing it. And sometimes we fall off, but we just get back on again. And I've inspired them to be able to do that. And I'm able to, because of Arbonne, I'm able to have all of my time with them. I can do all of the school drop-offs, all of the preschool drop-offs and pickups and everything. I've never once missed anything school related with the children. I get to take them to countries that before our barn, they would never have visited. So it was worth all of the effort that I put in. And I just want to say to everybody, if you are putting effort into your shop and it does feel tiring sometimes, know that it's worth it. Know that it's a short term sacrifice for such an amazing long term goal. You know, if somebody said to you, can you do something for one year, but for the next 60, 70 years, you're going to be earning at least £7,000 a month and it's actually going to go up. You're not going to have to work because you have to work. You're just going to work because you want to work and you can choose your hours. You're going to meet people. You're going to take your children on holidays with other people like you that have built their businesses to Hawaii in January every year. So in the October half term, take your children on these trips. You're going to be able to go to Africa and support orphanages and you're going to be able to help animals. You know, what you're passionate about because you've spent one year doing this all in for a massive 60 70 year long-term goal I would be like yes tell me what I have to do and that's what I did I was really intense with my business and I never ever judge other people that say to me I want to be at the third level but I want it to take me five years that's absolutely okay that's everybody's individual journey for me I wanted to cram it all in because I was like if I cram it all into one year it just means that my life would be a lot better and it is it's just absolutely amazing so the last bit my top tips our personal development and I know we hear it all the time and I was like oh for god's sake will they start banging on about personal development but I have to say if it wasn't for the personal development I've done 
with Arbon, I would not be where I am now. I used to have people start their business with Arbon and I wouldn't even want to sponsor them because I didn't believe I was a very good sponsor. And I'd be like, oh, I've got to speak to somebody else because I had no self-belief in myself. I didn't believe that I was good enough to own a shop. I didn't believe I was good enough to talk about products. I didn't believe that I was good enough to help inspire other people. And the only thing that has helped my confidence and my self-belief is reading these, well, books, not just these books, but, but books. So my first top book, is Don Fehler, the 45 second presentation, which is otherwise known as Own Your Life. And this talks about how network marketing works. It's absolutely amazing. I still read this even now, two years later, I continue to read this book. It's the book that I give to all of my new consultants because I think it explains network marketing in the most simplest form. It's fabulous. I love it. My second favorite book is GoPro by Eric Worre because when you own your own business, you have to have, um, you have to learn skills. So if you're a hairdresser, you have to learn color skills and cutting techniques and stuff. And whatever business you have, if you're a landscape gardener, you have to learn the skills to do with landscape gardening. In network marketing, we have to learn skills that help us run a really successful business. If we didn't learn skills, then everybody would be successful at network marketing. And that's just not the case. You do have to learn the skills to have a successful business. But the good thing for us is we only have seven seven skills and they're in here it tells you what the skills are and how you learn them that's it seven skills that's it like Vic's obviously gone to university got several degrees I bet she's got so many more skills to do with that I bet it's way more than seven but this is it seven skills to be successful at network marketing and again I read that over and over and over again GoPro is my massive go-to book for the skills so I love GoPro I also love The Compound Effect by Darren Harding which talks about baby steps that lead up to great things. So when I first started my business, it was just me, just my shop, that was it. And um, I was talking to people, no one was taking me seriously, nobody was believing that I was credible. I just felt like I wasn't really getting anywhere. And it was like I was like pushing a snowball up the hill and just not really getting anywhere. And it was exhausting. I was thinking, is it, am I actually right for this business? Am I actually good enough? Because I'm not getting anywhere. But actually what I was doing was planting little seeds to people like say my friends that were like, no way are we ever going to have anything to do with your shop, with your business. But all those little seeds were gradually starting to build up and the compound effect kicked in, which is just gradual little baby steps that eventually become something massive. And that was what happened to my business. My business was just me, nothing. And then gradually a couple of people said, oh, we're going to, yeah, we're going to do this as well. And then Vic obviously started and that just catapulted everything. AJ came along and it just went mental, but in a good way mental. And the compound effect means now that that snowball, I was like pushing up the hill, exhausted, is now rolling down the other side. And to be honest, the way that the team is running now, especially your to be area, if I said to Vic now, can you tell everybody in your team to stop doing what they're doing? I couldn't. Your team is like a runaway train. If I tried my hardest, I could not make you stop. It just it just runs now. And it, it's literally the compound effect where you put in the effort and put in the effort and put the effort in, and then it just goes with or without you. Honestly, if I drop dead now, I know that Vic and the whole team would continue to grow. There's nothing that I could do to stop it. And that is that, that compound effect. So I love that. And one book that I've read recently is The Entrepreneurial Roller Coaster. I wish that I'd read this a couple of years ago, to be honest, because when you start your own business, and I know a few of you have got your own businesses doing other things, but I didn't realize that when you start your own business, you do go on a bit of a roller coaster ride and you do have like really high highs, but you also have lows where you start to question yourself and you think, you know, am I good enough for this? Am I this? You know, this, this issues happen, this problems happened and you know, these different problems arise and you question yourself. And this book is not about network marketing, but it's about owning your own business. It's very easy to read. And it is about how, when you own your own business, you go through this process in your head of questioning yourself and, you know, worrying about things that actually you don't need to worry about. And it gives you so many tips about how to overcome problems that will happen in your business. You absolutely cannot avoid problems in your business. And this goes through it in such a simple and easy to read. I read this in 24 hours. I could not put it down. It was absolutely amazing. I wish I'd read it a couple of years ago, but it only came out about a month ago. So I love it. Absolutely love it. So I am massively, massively, um, Right, reading books and learning and continuously learning. Learn something every day. If you just spend 10 minutes listening to an audio or reading a book, or if you spend five hours 
doesn't matter, but make sure you're continuously learning every single day because it does make a difference to your business and your self-belief and the compound effect will still um, add up as well. So I realize I've talked for a little while. So if anybody does have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I know I've only skimmed over a few things, but before I uh, pass it back to Vic, I just want to say, if anyone would like my help with anything, if you want me to come to a one-to-one -one with you, if you want me to come to a workshop with you, if you want me to do an online event with you, um, a Discover Arbor, even like a one-to-one -one coaching call, a phone call, absolutely anything, I will be there for you. You guys are just the most amazing team. And if I can give back something, because you give me so much, if I can give back something for you, my time, my energy, my knowledge, anything that you need, if I can do it, I will. Just drop me a message and let me know. I know you have a phenomenal leader with Vic and, and Tejal's running an incredible business. But if I can do anything for you, just let me know and I'll do it. Right, Vic, I'll pass it back. Thank you, Danny. Um, that was lovely to hear. Like, I've heard your story like loads and loads of times. Each time you add something new to it, so it's never like hearing the same thing. And I got quite emotional at the start of the early story. Um, but just loads of things you said. Like, I love the way you um, linked it to Ian's job with Tylee, and that just made loads of sense. But I've just thought of a question. Um, when you have um, kind of a negative thought in your head, say you think, and I just can't speak to that person, maybe not now, but back in those early days, what's the kind of thought process that would go through your head? Oh, it's awful. My negative self-talk, you would not believe it. People are always really shocked by this because they always think I'm such a happy, positive person. And I am. And I will tell anybody all of the amazing things about them, but I don't say it to myself. So when I have a negative thought in my head, all I can hear myself, so say like when Vic first asked me about um, Arbon, what I probably thought in my head was, Danny, this girl is like really pretty. She's really nice. She's really successful she's married she's got two children she lives in her own house she's got a nice car what the hell are you doing Try, like messaging her back she's never ever going to be interested in what you've got to say you can't add any value to her life you don't have any confidence you're not good enough you know you might as well just give up now and send her to somebody else that's better so all of this horror it's like it's awful it's awful and what I have to do now is nip it straight in the bud and say to whatever those awful words are in my head is shut up because I'm not going to allow that to create the life for my children. And the biggest thing that helps me with all that awful self-talk is my why, which is my two daughters. Uh, everybody obviously has a different why. But when I hear all that horrible stuff in my head, I just think about Farrah and Havana and I think, what is more important to me? Ignoring that rubbish for my two beautiful, beautiful little girls or listening to that rubbish and going, do you know what? You're right. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty. I'm not smart. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm going to give up. And I have to weigh it up and I have to think, you know, which one? What would I rather do? Would I rather regret what I didn't do? Or would I rather regret what I did do, but I had so much fun along the way? So I, I, it is hard. And I am still making big progress on that awful self-talk. But I do have horrendous, horrendous self-talk. Oh, that's really cool. Thanks for that, Danny. Has anyone else got any questions? Is Lindsay up or is she just moving? <laughs> Hang on, Lindsay. One sec. Go on. Oh. There you go. Um, I was just going to say that. How do you get um, workshops booked in by people? Well, okay, I'll tell you all a secret. It's not a good one though. I have different strengths and weaknesses to a lot of people and my strength is sponsoring consultants and meeting new people and then wanting to join the business um, and helping them get started. My weakness is my personal um, product business. That is my weakness. So I tend to uh, focus more on my strength, which is sponsoring business builders and helping them get going because I don't seem to have mastered booking workshops that are just for me. I'll do workshops for my consultants. I do them all of the time. And I actually do them really, really well. When it's for somebody else, I'm really good at what I do. But when I do it for me, it's like, all that self-talk it's just horrendous so it's something that I am working on and if anyone's got any advice for me I'll be very grateful to listen to a training on that Vic has taught me so 
much like and all of you have like Tay online events I'm like oh my god it's amazing that girl's a genius you've all taught me so 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 much and I'm still continuing to learn but that is actually one of my weaknesses however I do know people that are amazing at booking workshops so what we can do Lindsay if you want and for anybody else that's interested we can get someone to do a training on it because actually I'd really benefit from that as well Mm, yeah because I'm um from what you know when I was at the um training on Monday when Zoe was obviously showing around the sheer butter and I just found that really like useful like showing somebody one product with the ingredients yeah. and live street and I just thought that was amazing wasn't it what a good idea so people might get what Arbon is more if I did that you know and so I'm thinking of doing a workshop but then I'm like how do I get across to people to come to my house for that? Do you know what I mean? Or get yeah. somebody to host one. Have you watched Kelly Bromley's call that she did a couple of days ago? No, I've not watched that yet. I watched that. And like I say, booking events for my personal business are my weakness that I'm working on um, continuously. And I watched that call and I wrote so many notes from that call. And I've actually listened to it twice. And she does talk about booking, how to book your own workshop. So have a watch of that. and then. Yeah. We could do like a training on it and I'm sure Vic will be happy to have like a guest speaker on that if that's their strength, they can talk about it. To be honest, I can't seem to sponsor PCs. Everybody I speak to wants to be a business builder and it's not a bad thing, but honestly, nobody I speak to wants to just use products. They want to do the business. So it's just, that's just my strength and I just accept it. But I am working on my weakness of building a client base more so. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> One thing Lindsay's really, really good at, and one of her strengths from the early days is you will talk to like people that you know, um, like a work, you've got quite a really strong PC base and client base. Yeah. Um, there's nothing to say that you don't have to just show that kind of idea of that sheer butter to a couple of people. It doesn't have to be a massive room of five, six people. Why don't you do a video on it, Lindsay? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. People love videos, and if you share it on your Facebook page, it goes to a massive network. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, people probably would be too scared to come to a workshop because they don't really know what it's about. If they see that, yeah. they might be like, oh, actually, yeah, I get it. Yeah, because I don't want to kind of like promote a work. Because when you ask somebody to come, I think they are put off because they think, oh, you know, what's she selling now, kind of thing. So I don't want to like force it up upon somebody, but I just want people to know what they actually are using because yeah. they'll go to shop and buy a 99p bottle of shampoo or whatever. Well, Lindsay, yeah. just say that. Just say I, I educate people on I educate people that care about their health and their well-being on using safe products because let's face it, everything bought from a shop is not safe to actually really use, is it? And then most people go why what's wrong with shop products and then you can just tell them from then so just say that just say if somebody says what do you do or what you've been up to just say oh, i've been working on my business you know i i i help people that care about their health and well-being to find alternatives to the products because most people don't want to use shop bought products because of what's in them something like that really easy to flow and say yeah, yeah. and then they'll go i care about my health tell me <laughs> yeah that's a good idea yeah Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you very much, Danny. I didn't know you were going to stop recording now, are you? Yeah, I'll stop then.